All right. Hi, we welcome you to another episode of Learning Stories. This is a show where we interview a diverse set of learners from the 21st century. In each episode of this show, we interview a guest who has a story to share about how they acquired a set of skills and knowledge in a creative and innovative way. In the process, we hope to uncover a new understanding of learning as conceptualized and imagined by the guest on our show. A focus for this season of learning stories is to speak to amazing young Indians who are doing um, powerful things in their own context to shape the future of our country. And one such amazing young Indian is Arun Mullot. Um, he's a he's a friend that I went to school with, and uh, we recently reconnected through LinkedIn. And I think he's uh, had such a inspiring journey, and we're here to learn a little bit about him. But uh, let's get into his bio before we uh, start our discussion. So Arun is the head of bus- business development at the Gagan Narang Sports Promotion Foundation. This is a nonprofit that runs Guns for Glory, India's premier shooting academy. Arun's job is to engage in partnerships and collaborate with central and state government bodies, as well as private institutions to promote the academy and the athletes in the Olympic sport of shooting. Prior to this role, he was the chief operating officer at Wellaw City, a multi-sport academy where he managed multiple verticals including football, cricket, MMA and shooting. He has a postgraduate diploma from SMRI uh, Kochi uh, and before his stint in sports management, he also completed a four-year engineering degree and spent two years working as a quality analyst. So there's a lot to unpack there. But before we go into your journey, Arun, you know, I'd love to know a little bit about your childhood. You know, what were some of the things you enjoyed doing? Where did you study? And uh, was sports always a passion for you growing up? Uh, first of all, thanks for having me here, Abhishek. It's uh, great to connect with you also after a long time. Speaking about my journey, I, well, my childhood was spent, I was, uh, I was brought up in Bahrain. Just like you, I was. Uh, I initially went to the Asian school Bahrain, and uh, after graduating out, I shifted to my hometown, and that's in Kochi in Kerala. That's where I did my graduation in engineering as well. Uh, speaking about my childhood, uh, I would say that. So uh, one thing that I should tell you is, I was diagnosed early on with uh, meningitis. So meningitis is a disease that affects the spinal fluid the fluid uh, covering your brain basically that's called the meninges the reason i was constantly falling sick and at that point of time uh, my parents or the doctors initially could not figure out what exactly was the challenge or what is the reason i kept falling sick all over again this is somewhere around the uh, first standard i believe and uh, at that point of time i sort of completely was cut off from the outside environment and at that time i used to watch a lot of these kids out there playing your you know local sports and uh, I, I I used to dream. It's 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 the honest truth that I used to dream of playing sports, just watching the other kids play around because I was a really sick kid. Really, for me, the meningitis was detected or diagnosed uh, quite early, so for that reason, it did not cause any serious damage or tumors, which are the long term consequences. So the moment, uh, so I had to undergo treatment for three months. I was uh, admitted to a hospital as well. The moment. Uh, I recovered from that disease and came back to my normal to normal school and other affairs. I was the only thing on my mind was sports, and I think it just sort of took off from there. I started with cricket. I went into football. Football was always a long term uh, thing for me, but initially I dabbled in a lot of different sports. I I went I tried out uh, karate as well, and uh, karate unfortunately didn't work out because I wasn't particularly a healthy kid at that point of time. But my childhood was mostly built around sports for that reason because of the early onset of meningitis. I, I sort of uh, dreamt of uh, becoming a sports person, watching you know uh, legends like uh, Kobe Bryant uh, uh, in Lakers and in LA Lakers. Uh, he uh, may rest in peace. And other, um, of course, our Indian athletes as well, uh, Sachin Tendulkar. Uh, MS Dhoni later on. All of them played a pivotal role in uh, inspiring people like me to take up sports. Yeah, that's that's amazing, Arun. I can't imagine how hard it must have been for you and your family. And 
you know, you found that outlet in sports, you know, to really express yourself. And, you know, that's something I was curious about, Aaron. Like you've, you know, trained and worked with a lot of young people playing sports, you know, and playing at a very competitive level. So what are some skills you think young people can develop from playing any sport, not just shooting? Like what are some life lessons you think they can acquire from uh, being actively involved in a physical activity? Well, it's interesting that you say physical activity, Abhishek, because uh, since you mentioned shooting, I should say that, uh, of course, all sports for that matter, even chess, for example, uh, is uh, it, it has its own uh, physical and mental attributes. So, of course, uh, uh, ch- games like chess are mostly where you do not do a lot of uh, movement, physically speaking. But they say that uh, the chess grandmasters burn uh, hundreds and thousands of calories while they are play- going through their matches. So that does tend to show you, and of course, the brain consumes around sixty percent of, you know, the the food that we eat, the you know, the caloric content that we consume. So at that point of time, the more interesting point, the question is, where do you learn to apply these attributes of yours? What sort of attributes does the sport that you play enhance? Uh, to broadly classify them, you can classify them into two: one is an individual sport like chess or shooting or archery. And then you have the team sports like your cricket, basketball, hockey, football. So these are the kind of broad classifications that we bring into the sport as in uh, I bring in my current role as well. Because at this point of time, when we work with the athlete, we need to put ourselves in their shoes. We need to understand what exactly it is that they are going through. And at that point of time, you need to understand what are the inputs, what are the requirements that the athlete needs in order for them to perform at an optimum level and at an enhanced level. And so, putting yourself in the shoes of the athlete, you understand that it is not just... Suppose, for example, a lot of people think that uh, football is just about kicking the ball into the goalpost, into the net. But uh, as we all know, it is one of the most widely watched sports on the planet. And there are a lot of components that go into making a football team work. There is a team chemistry factor. There is the point of managing the team, making sure that put, you, you cannot put uh, square pegs in round holes and expect them to function the way you want them to. And when you've got now coming to individual sports, here you have to understand that coaching is the primary and the most important component in grooming an athlete. And uh, so I work for Gun for Glory Shooting Academy, India's uh, top ranked institution for teaching the Olympic sport of shooting. So, uh, for those of you who who don't know, I'll just give them an introduction into what Gun for Glory is. Gun for Glory was founded by the Commonwealth and Olympic medalist uh, Shri Gagan Narang and his coach Shri Pawan Singh. It was founded in 2011 under the aegis of Gagan Narang Sports Promotion Foundation, which is the non-profit that I work for. And uh, it was founded with the aim and the vision of producing medals in the Olympic sport of shooting for India. And at that point of time, there were not a lot of academies that thought uh, shooting as a sport in the country. And even if you look at a broader uh, sporting culture in our country, in India specifically, we have not had that academy culture or that teaching culture. So you yourself being into teaching will realize the importance of having a mentor, of having somebody who can guide you, mold you understand your perspective, understand the realities of the environment into which you're pushing the child. Because most often we are working with children. So, you know, uh, it's like they say, it's one of my favorite sayings is education in youth is like engraving in stone. So here you, you will encounter challenges. You will, each child is unique. Each child has their own set of skills and they have their, let's not call it weaknesses. Let's just say that they have their own traits or they have Things that balance out their strengths. So at that point of time, it is important to understand what, how you can motivate the child, how you can work with them. So we have a lower age limit of 10 years in our academy, taking into account some of the safety rules and regulations, as you can imagine, go into doing what we do. So, so for that reason, we work with kids from uh, uh, school curriculum age of somewhere around fourth or fifth grade onwards. And there is no, and the beauty of uh, shooting sport is that there is no upper age limit to it. So we just have a lower age limit of 10 years in our sport. There is absolutely no upper age limit. And so for that reason, I also tried uh, shooting at the age of 26. So I started out pretty late. 
but then i was inspired by the story of uh, your name say abhishek verma uh, he is not a very popular figure but he started he was an engineer just like myself uh, he started out shooting at the age of somewhere around 25 and at the age of 30 he was playing the olympics so it tends to show that all you need in this case a lot of people under the expectation a lot of parents these days uh, want their children to start off at an early age thinking that if i don't give the because i did not get this chance here meaning uh, the parent has often not got that chance because all of our parents okay not not everybody but most of us wanted uh, most of our parents wanted us to go into a professional environment maybe work for a corporate or uh, you know start your own business or that sort of thing but as we realize there is a lot more to life than just uh, building a career out of it it's also about building a well rounded personality and that is where sports coming back to your original question that is where sports you know plays a huge role abhishek because that is where you learn to work as part of a team you learn the the, the essence of uh, sportsman spirit of learning what it takes to sacrifice yourself so that you know the the unit works or you know the team succeeds at that point of time so sports can teach you a lot in that perspective and uh, <clears throat> not, uh, not just as a sports person but as somebody who's worked in sports administration i see that we can get into this later but a lot of women who have uh, actually started out as athletes tend to go on to occupy high level positions in various uh, you know corporations and uh, companies so i think sports plays a major role in that sense as well. Yeah, that's that's powerful, Arun. You know, you you summarize that really well. But in terms of your journey, Arun, you know, I know you transitioned from you know being an engineer to this field of sports management. So, you know, can you tell me a little bit about that journey for you? Like, why did you choose engineering, and then why did you choose sports management um, in your career? That's a very good question. And uh, to be honest, it was a little bit of luck. it was a little bit of uh, misfortune as well as uh, a lot of combined factors that go into a- any major decision that we take in our life today but uh, one uh, one of the reasons i so the reason i took up engineering is because i i i went into the computer science field so i did my btech in uh, computer science and engineering from one of the uh, top ranking government institutions in kerala and uh, at that point of time all we knew when we graduated so there was a lot of career counseling you and us, you and me being from isb we know that a uh, lot of career counseling was there during schooling days as well and uh, all we kept hearing about or all we, all the, what we kept uh, what we wanted to hear maybe was placements so what we wanted to know was uh, which which company is coming recruiting in this particular college nobody actually talked about that four years of experience you know i mean if you're going into btech you have to go through four years so at that point of time very few people talk about the whole college experience or maybe uh, maybe it was just the culture that i was brought up in so all we kept hearing about was what you will do after college so at that point of time there was not a really a lot of thought we put into all we knew is get into a good college and your life and just you know pass out with good grades and your life is settled turns out that's not the case college for me was an eye opener in uh, in a lot of ways so uh, i was brought up in bahrain uh, in the kingdom of bahrain which is a very tiny island for our viewers uh, very tiny island uh, next to saudi arabia uh, in the arabian sea the kind of opportunities that we got i to be honest abhishek you we were born with a silver spoon i mean the kind of uh, opportunities that we had or maybe the kind of resources that were given to us were huge and for me it was a uh, quantum leap to move on from uh, 12 passing out of 12th grade from a private school in bahrain to coming to kerala and to coming to india for that matter to understand the perspective of the everyday man and at that point it did take me a while to get adjusted to uh, the new environment that i had to transition over to but by the time i did that one year of college was already done and uh, people were going for internships meanwhile here i was still struggling to write my assignments and submit them on time and uh, computer science is actually one of the easier fields in uh, in engineering compared to your core disciplines like mech or uh, electrical for that matter so by the time i was uh, two years into college people were already deciding on their future path and i was still stuck and a, lo- a message to youngsters out there this is perfectly normal 
a lot of my friends went through the same thing and at that time the common bonding element was sports so i had a bunch of friends who were extremely passionate about uh, football at that point of time and uh, during school days also i used to dabble in it quite often i was in and out of the school team as well but i never took it as seriously as you know for that matter india does have a very good sporting culture when it comes to when it comes to glory when it comes to achieving something but what we that's what i said that's what what we don't have is the academy setup or the you know learning setup for uh, you know actually picking up the sport and it is all focused on medals so it is all focused on the ultimate aim so if you are an olympian if you are a javelin thrower you want to be the next neeraj chopra if you if you are an athlete if you are a boxer you want to be the next mary kom or the next lovelina now a lot of it is centered around medals and success and landing and unfortunately there are other elements like landing a government job or getting a lot of uh, you know if you win a medal at the olympics you are pretty much guaranteed cash injection from half a dozen state and central government agencies so that is what people in our country and i'm not saying it's a bad thing i'm glad it is there to back up the athletes but at the same time there was no support system for those people who did not uh, succeed in the sport and this is what happened to me because uh, during so i was in the college team i was in the university team and i was a goalkeeper i been a, i was a goalkeeper for like 20 years and i had a major injury which kept me out of the game for uh, around 16 months and at this point of time i was completely disconnected from reality so this was somewhere around the second year of engineering went on to my third year and of course I, my academics happened on the side but i was forever disappointed because it was meningitis all over again it was first standard all over again and to realize that this is a part of life it took a lot of time for that thought to settle in because unfortunately i was not born into a family of athletes i was born into a family of academicians a lot of my uh, cousins a lot of my uncles aunts were high achievers they were professors phd holders uh, you know a lot of lot of engineers as well so i did not unfortunately have anybody to turn to but uh, my friends uh, kept me going at that point of time and the, when i recovered from the injury i knew by then that uh, my career as a professional was pretty much done because i was around 20 at that time and if you want to make it as a professional uh, in india especially in uh, football for example you need to start out early and you need to succeed early uh, a couple of my friends went on to play the isl uh, a few were play for the navy and in i league as well so i do i did have the opportunity of i i can tell uh, you know the kids that i work with that i have played with professionals who are playing it in the in at the highest levels of the game so what i feel personally speaking is that there should be a platform for athletes to succeed not just as sports persons or as athletes in their respective field but also as human beings and they need that they need that support system to exist in order for uh, you know them to succeed and to become better human beings and that i think is a vital role that we as individuals people like me who are into this field that is the contribution that we have to make to society yeah i think that's that's really powerful arun you know and i feel like there's a lot spoken about the success of an athlete but you know there's a there's a lot there's a long process leading up to that successful medal and even beyond that you know their life beyond that medal is also as important as their life leading up to it now you know i know you pursued a, a sports management course at smri in kolkata and i was looking through the curriculum and it's something i've never you know thought about because i'm also really passionate about sports and i i saw some of the courses there and i'm like this is so amazing to learn so like and right after after you finished that course arun you managed a, a sports academy and a sports setup called velocity so how like what did you learn in the course and how did you apply that in that job at velocity for four years where you were actually managing an academy it started out at velocity as an intern and at the end of four years i was the ceo over there so i i had like a you know, <laughs> i had a good graph over there it was it was a very small institution but uh, i did most of my learning there but the prelude to that was of course my uh, my smri days that was in kochi in kerala 
and uh, it, it's funny it was another coincidence that that i came across this because uh, i i did work as you mentioned when you introduced me i did work uh, uh, one and a half years 18 months as a quality analyst at uh, at a corporate uh, institution and uh, that also was an eye opener to be honest and of course that, that was because i graduated out and got placed almost immediately so th- it was the natural way of things it was just the way that it, it happened you know you you done with engineering you get placed in a company you start working there you undergo the training process then you realize how the organization functions suddenly you are into the rat race and then uh, it's like every day is uh, I, i wouldn't say it's monotonous but i would say that it is a routine by itself and suddenly somewhere down the line around 6 to 8 months or around a year into that point of time i realized that okay maybe just maybe uh, there's nothing wrong with the job role but it just might it, it's again the question of uh, square pegs and round holes maybe this is not what is right for me and at that point when i expressed this thing when i expressed this concern to my parents i was one of those fortunate ones who had very supportive parents so they told me that uh, of course they had the usual worries about having a secure job and you know that sort of fact up in place but they did understand the need to pursue what you are passionate about and so for that reason i'm in- incredibly grateful to my mom and dad for all the support uh, that they offered me at that point of time so i did have a discussion with the hr team and uh, the the hr team was also very helpful they did suggest a few institutions to me as well for pursuing my interest in sports and when i graduated out uh, sorry when i uh, when i left uh, sutherland which is where i worked for 18 months i wanted i did take a break i did uh, i didn't sort of my own thing i dabbled in a few uh, you know alternative schemes for like a couple of months uh, but then by then i knew that uh, sports is what i wanted to get into and my mom was also very helpful she did a lot of google searching a lot of quora hunting and uh, she she is the one who came across this particular college and so when i so the reason i took up the sports management degree is because i felt that at that point of time so i had already done a bit of management man management in my earlier job as well i was auditing around 30 30 employees in as my in my role as a quality analyst at sutherland so at that point of time i knew that maybe working with people might be more suitable to me than say working in front of a pc even though even though i had this background in computer science and engineering i really did feel that maybe because i i i always had that uh, say that attribute of uh, communicating well with people so for that reason i could i i could sense that I, when i speak to those people i was able to deliver the message of what it is that we wanted out of them, what i wanted them to do and they would understand and they were able to apply it so i thought maybe management would be the right way to go which is the reason why i did the pgdsm course and smri what it did was that was also an eye opener again a lot of experiences a lot of things that we thought about the sports environment which were true and wrong uh, during my uh, early days in my pgdsm course to understand for example the fact that the indian sporting industry is very much uh, baby industry it is still booming it is still growing and at this point of time it is like let's say the the it industry in the same still learning it is still understanding and it is still evolving as its own industry and at that point of time you cannot expect to walk into it like you can walk into a corporate environment like you may walk into like say the pharma industry or the corp- any corporate industry for that matter so sports is not a corporate industry actually so at that point of time what well uh, sorry what uh, smri did for me was basically push me out into the open environment and i had to work with uh, several uh, you know government agencies i worked with the kerala state electricity board to conduct a series of uh, basketball competitions so it was a lot of uh, learning in on the ground level we did a lot of event management stuff we uh, conducted the series of competitions called hoopathon which was basically uh, a series of matches in different districts of the state between india's all star team all star women's basketball team versus a team called ringwood hawks from uh, a professional team from australia so they would play a series of matches in so basketball is still it it, it is still uh, fortunately or fortunately it's still a latent 
you know sport in india but those who have played it really understand uh, the energy take uh, the energy the dynamic that go into the sport and i will be honest i believe that basketball is the most uh, intensive sport out there i mean there are a lot of extreme sports uh, which might uh, you know take the take the crown but basketball is sort of the mainstream sport where there is a lot of chance for injuries first of all there's a lot of uh, there's a need for sport science intervention whether it is a physiotherapist you need a strength and conditioning expert you need a rehabilitation expert you need a lot of you know support staff if you wish to you know make it as an as a basketball player so uh, one of my uh, one of my uh, he was my classmate during my pgdsm days and he also went on to work with me in my first job at uh, velocity he was also a state level basketball player so he used to tell me about all the elements that go into this uh, into the sport and i had played it very uh, i mean i have played it at uh, you know just just for fun basically but i did not have any professional training so at that point of time i realized that uh, every sport has its own nuances and uh, coming to the administrative part of it so what pgdsn taught me was that our environment indian sporting environment it it is frankly a work in progress there are a lot of things uh, there is uh, too early to get into the politics of it maybe maybe not but there is uh, definitely uh, that component as well there's a lot of questions and a lot of controversy surrounding uh, indian sports unfortunately but on a broader level everybody wants to do what is best for the sport and they want to see at least succeed they want to see india succeed a lot of people who are born with that passion of wearing the indian the india indian tricolor on their uh, jacket and a lot of people who are working extremely hard to make that happen and that is something that i learned during my stint at uh, sm yeah and i um, i think you know you speak for a lot of um, like the emotions that a lot of indians have with sports is also very strong right and i think for a majority of us it's often cricket because that's the one we're most exposed to growing up and you see like the parallels between a sport like cricket and a lot of other sports in in the country right where you in cricket for instance you have a strong like ecosystem that allows these athletes to function at a very high level and then even at the national level with competitions like the IPL there are funding and exposure sort of strategies that allow them to increase their skill set but also they have like you know the support environment of nutritionists of dietitians of psychologists of therapists and you know i, I was looking at uh, Gag- shri gagan narang's story as well i know that early on in his journey he had the support of this organization called olympic gold quest and that was started by geet sethi and prakash padukone and that sort of support really helped him when he was an athlete competing you know at the london olympics at the beijing olympics so like w- with respect to your work at the gagan narang uh, sports foundation arun you know I, i wanted you to throw some light on maybe how the sport of shooting functions so what is it like for an athlete to start off and actually make it big in that sport and then what are some support systems that your organization can give that athlete as they go to the highest level in that sport the uh, shri gagan narang's graph is a very very enlightening one now that you say uh, now that you hit upon that point of shit that uh, because uh, so of course our india's very first olympic medal uh, sorry the olympic gold medal came from shri abhinav bindra in 2008 at the beijing olympics which was in the 10 meter air rifle event which is one of the most popular events out there uh, prior to that there was of course india's first medal the olympic medal in shooting sport came in the double trap event and that was uh, shri uh, lieutenant colonel rajyavardhan singh rathor in the 2004 athens olympics so uh, rathor ji being from the army uh, he had a different sort of uh, support system in place and uh, they they obviously have a lot of resources when it comes to training when it comes to access to weaponry access to targets access to world class coaching etc uh, shri abhinav bindra uh, like like us maybe was born with a little more golden than a silver spoon let's say uh, because he was he had the resources to set up 
uh, shooting range in his own backyard, in his own house. But Mr. Gagan Narayan's story is very interesting because if you've seen, so you mentioned you've seen the TED Talks. So there is a TED Talk on YouTube about uh, Mr. Narayan's journey into shooting sports. And of course, I work being uh, being one of the senior figures in his foundation. I get a, I've had the privilege of working with him. And for that reason, a lot of things that I've learned from him as an athlete, but also as a sports uh, administrator, because he is currently the vice president of the Indian Olympic Association. So, in addition to being an Olympic medalist and starting the Dunford Glory Shooting Academy, he has gone on to do a lot for uh, Indian sports. He was, of course, the chef division. He was a leader of the Indian Olympic contingent at the Paris Olympics, in fact, at the regular uh, Olympics, that is. So, for that reason, there's a lot of, lot of insights that he has uh, shared with us. But uh, to speak about that, uh, so you asked me two questions. One is regarding... Uh, really, these are the states or the cities which produce the maximum number of athletes, the maximum number of Olympians who go, go on to do well in their various sports. But it, it does show that there is that, uh, you know, sporting culture inherent in those states. So yeah, I, I guess that would have helped them in that sense. The parents would have had the right mindset. But uh, shooting as a sport, which is, again, touching on your second question about how to get into the sport, shooting as a sport has held that, uh, let's say, that uh, that caption of uh, being an elite man sport or being an expensive sport, let's say. Because the kind of equipment, the kind of uh, weapons that they use are pretty expensive. Uh, they cost, like, say, for example, the weapon that you see uh, Manu Bakur use at the current uh, Paris Olympics. Her, her pistol costs somewhere around two and a half to three and a half lakhs. So for that reason... It is an expensive sport. There's a, there's no two ways about it. But what uh, Shri Gagan Narang managed to do is to sort of bring down that affordability factor by by actually creating an ecosystem. So you touched upon OGQ, upon Oli- Olympic Gold Quest. And uh, Gagan Narang is sort of the poster boy for uh, OGQ because he was one of the first athletes to be sponsored by OGQ. And he is the first one to win an Olympic medal. And uh, the major factor he stresses upon is not the funding or the sponsorship that you get once you become an elite level athlete. But what you need to get to that position where you can play the international competitions. Where you are on that precipice. Where you are one, you're showing yourself as a talent. You are among the best among your peers in the country. Maybe you have won a couple of national medals. And at that point you are on that precipice where you are about to take the leap. And at that point of time, what you need is the right kind of guidance, not just on monetary terms, but also at a at an intellectual or let's say uh, it is more of a mentorship that you require at that point of time. And uh, when it comes to speaking about my institution, about Nanpur Glory, of course, in addition to Sri Gagan Naran, we have some of the top coaching talents in the country. So, these coaching talents did not become coaches overnight. They were also athletes to begin with. So, it is about identifying the right kind of people. It, it, is, it, is, an, it is a human resource uh, task, basically, to identify the right kind of qualities in a person. So, there might be a person who is an athlete. So, this is me at the end of my engineering. I'm just done with, uh, I'm, I'm just done with my college. I'm, I was not able to make it big in my sport. And at that point of time, the question comes, what do I do with my kids? A lot of people choose to go into government jobs because that is a safe and secure option out there. Luckily for me, even though my parents did hint at it, I did not want to do that. I was not enchanted by the prospect of job security or pensions after I turned 60. I wanted to do something right now. And at that point of time, sports was the most dynamic and still continues to be one of the most dynamic environments in our country. And so when I got into Kanpo Glory Shooting Academy, I encountered a very young team, a very dynamic and vibrant young team who were very passionate about doing something because they felt that maybe I was not able to make it as an athlete. But now I have all these learnings. I have I have gone through the pipeline that molds a national medalist. But what does it take to convert the next national medalist into an international medalist? So there was a very moving moment uh, in August when uh, Swapnil Kusale won uh, India's third medal in uh, in shooting at the Paris Olympics 
in the 50 meter rifle shooting category where there was a discussion between two of india's former great athletes one being mr gagan narang himself and the other was joydeep karmakar so mr joydeep karmakar finished fourth in the 2012 london olympics in the 50 meter event so you can imagine how hard it must have been for him to just finish below the podium level and when sopnil won 50 meter uh, there was a discussion on geo cinema between uh, mr narang and uh, between jk and uh, mr narang where they discussed the 50 meter event where the indian federation chose not to send athletes to internationals in the 50 meter event because there was no chance of us getting a medal so we've come a long way from that now we've actually gone on to win so in a very moving uh, moment mr narang actually broke into tears because he said that so he's represented india in the 50 meter event as well at the olympics in fact and uh, it was a very moving moment for the reason that it showed how much the sport had come across in the last 10 day, 10 in the last decade and so it sort of speaks volumes for the effort that people like him have put in people uh, organizations like OGQ, the central government with its initiatives like the Target Olympic Podium Scheme, which is a central government initiative by the MYAS, Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sports. The Kilo India Scheme more recently, which has, uh, you know, which focuses on identifying talents at a younger age. So we talk about why China has so many Olympic medals. Why does the US have so many Olympic medals? But India is still lagging behind. The reason is that that inherent sporting culture has yet to develop in our country. It is there. It is still there in each and every one of us. Which is the reason why with in the limited time frame in the last decade, we managed to produce uh, five medals in sorry, uh, that's, sorry, seven medals in shooting sport uh, in the last couple of decades. That's the Olympic medals that I'm talking about. And not to mention sports like hockey which in which we have a really rich history. And archery where we always seem to be on the precipice of doing well. Uh, Sheetal Devi is a great example in the Para-Olympics. So she, her story, of course, everybody knows. Uh, she tells story being born without arms. The very, the very, all you need to do is look at her. You, all you need to do is watch her play, and your mood. You that that's the whole reason people like me are in this uh, industry, Abhishek. Because to see those people come through, to see. Uh, so I have an athlete. Uh, she she is a U.S. citizen, but she's uh, she's Indian. She played the U.S. Junior Olympics. And uh, when she came back with a medal, she video called me to show me the medal. And all I could think of was the 10-year-old who walked into the academy in Velocity asking what does a gun look like and I am the one who handed her a gun for the very first time. So to see these kids go on to make waves in the international circuit, it is actually very... Uh, I, 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 can't ex- I can't describe a better feeling. I can't describe the feeling that you get. It, it, it is... It is what it is. It is the best feeling to see these children come through and make it big in the sport. And that is what drives, uh, you know, people like me and, of course, the team that I work with. Because it's a bunch of very passionate, very uh, highly motivated individuals who feel that, okay, maybe I was not able to do it, but I want to contribute to the sport. And that sort of thing, that sort of uh, motivation or that sort of skill cannot be taught. It has to come from inside. Yeah. Yeah, and like uh, like I was just thinking about India's performance in the last Olympics. The most medals we won were in shooting, you know, with Manu Bakar winning in the individual and team event and then Swapnil winning that medal in the other individual event. So, you know, just to think about how much, how much you know, media coverage a sport like shooting receives, you know, in comparison to maybe cricket. And I think that... For most people growing up in India, there's always that comparison to cricket, right? As the hierarchy in terms of the ecosystem we have there and the ecosystem. But, you know, I was looking at the Olympic medal tally for the last 20 to 40 years. You know, at least in the last 20 years, China has been dominating the shooting events. And then before that, the Soviet Union and Russia had like a long run. So what are some things that these two countries had in their ecosystem that was able to produce, you know, such positive results that maybe we can learn from as a country and adapt, not just in Guns for Glory, but at the district and state level of different setups around the country. So, you know, we have more of these results coming out in the long. So again, a good question. Well, 
it points to the broader sporting ethos or the holistic environment that we strive to create. And like I said, uh, Abhishek, it's not all, I mean, of course, the Olympic medal or the medals, whether it is the pre-Olympics, whether it is at international level or at state or district or national levels, it is more about driving that spirit of playing a sport. So the whole reason, so you you mentioned, of course, the Soviet Union and uh, China. I would like to bring across another example. So I'm not going to talk about, I will talk about shooting in a moment. But I'm going to talk about sports in general. There, So there's a very interesting statistic. I think this was after the Rio Olympics that the statistic came out that the city of Manchester in the UK has more Olympic medals than any country uh, below the top 10 at the Olympics. Basically, uh, around uh, close to 150 countries compete in the Olympics, if I'm not wrong. And around 140 of them did not have the combined medal tally that the city of Manchester in the UK had. So at that point of time, the the, the question does come, okay, what it is, that, is it something that Manchester is doing differently? Is it the people there that are doing differently? Is it something to do with the genetics? Like they asked the question about the Jamaican when it comes to the track and field events. And Jamaica aside, coming to Manchester, the very obvious link at that point of time is industrialization which happened in the 18th century, in the late uh, 18th and the 19th and 20th, early 20th centuries, where the factory culture came in and people were sort of, so we know we know how monotonous uh, factory work can be. So at that point of time, what they wanted was to sort of, once they were done with their work, either you go to the nearest ale, uh, you know, the drone thing there, or else they had the idea of, you know, forming a community, uh, forming a group and playing some sort of sport. And... I, I am a strong believer in that kind of institution, which sort of relies on building a community in a, based around the sport. Because what that does is it just not it doesn't just groom you to become a good athlete, but it also grooms you to become part of something you know bigger than yourself. And at that point of time, what it does is it sort of builds that culture of integrating sports into your everyday life, which is something that India might be lacking. To be very honest, so a lot of uh, schools emphasize on the need nowadays. Things are changing, of course. A lot of schools out there who have a built-in sporting curriculum along with their uh, curricular activities. It is not even an extracurricular activity anymore. It is a co-curricular activity, which I would say is a seismic shift in our education system. The government is doing its uh, bit as well. If you ask me, well, if you take there is obviously now coming to the genetic factor. There is obviously the fact that uh, countries like the Czech Republic, the Italians, the Soviet Union or the or Russia, yes, they have done well in the sport. And it does point to some sort of, uh, now if you ask me, I cannot really, because Soviet Union, if you look at the results, it is not, it is not a consistent set of uh, medals. It is more like they have produced elite level athletes. So there are a few prospects who shine head and shoulders over the like India has Neeraj Chopra. So we have that kind of talent come through the ranks uh, in every sport. Some of them make it like Neeraj did. So some of them sort of stumble at at you know at some juncture like uh, uh, you know some of the athletes we've seen at uh, the Paris Olympics as well. So at that point of time, the more uh, the more important question is what is the ecosystem needed to produce this kind of uh, medal tally? And what China does is China has integrated it into their educational curriculum. The Chinese have managed to sort of convince the parents, the convince the everyday individual that sport is a part of your everyday life. Now you can choose to become an athlete, meaning a professional. Or you can just choose to integrate into it into your everyday activity. Instead of going at the home at the end of the day, switching on the TV and scrolling through, you know, or scrolling through your uh, smartphone feed, you can choose to go out there, engage with the broader community, and at that point of time, come back with a set of values which you would never learn from any school. So it is about building that community. Like that is what the Mancunians did in the UK in the 19th century. That is what China and maybe the Soviet Union as well. I need to look into that. But when it comes to shooting sport, I think that's what we are doing here at Gun for Glory. Because what we are doing is we are building a community here where it is about finding the talent. But at the same time, it is about nurturing what they already have. 
and that is to groom them to become better human beings so i have an athlete here uh, his name is dhanush kikan dhanush is a hearing impaired uh, kid he has a cochlear implant which he's had since the age of 1 and for that reason he cannot uh, he doesn't hear or speak the way we we do and yet he so uh, dhanush is a popular figure in the shooting sport because he is a deaf olympian so he played the deaf olympics in uh, brazil in 2022 and he won two gold medals setting the world record as well so uh, he when he came back he was received very warmly by the by the federations by the national federations he had a chance to meet with the prime minister as well so uh, it was a sort of acknowledgement for the effort that dhanush has put in but what the broader story uh, is uncovered when you realize that even being hearing impaired dhanush is actually an international medalist in the regular category as well meaning he competes with the regular kids you know uh, the ones who can hear and speak and function completely and he has won four medals as a deaf athlete and seven medals as a regular athlete meaning he is even better as a regular athlete compared to a deaf athlete and as a teacher abhishek you realize that communication is extremely important to to reach your child to reach the you know children in front of you to reach any audience for that matter regardless of their age and for a for an athlete who really cannot you know communicate like a normal person does to to reach to to reach to reach that level it is not easy and it is something it is something uh, emboldening to think that you know maybe in spite of being born with the so called deficiencies you might still be able to achieve things that uh, you know otherwise you would think that only a normal you know completely uh, able person would be able to do again you talk about the para olympics or the deaf olympics the fact is that these guys are elite level athletes abhishek they are at the pinnacle of the sport the olympics is the olympics is of is a cream of the crop so you're talking about the best in the sport so at the paris olympics we had two athletes uh, from my academy and uh, the funny thing is uh, one of them is a two time olympian and she's only 24 and the other is uh, so that is elevenel waller even uh, the other is ramita jindal at the age of 20 she's actually managed to play the olympics and when you speak to these kids if, if people saw the manu bakar interview they would realize how disappointed she was in spite of winning two medals when she finished fourth in her other event in the 25 meter event but uh, when i spoke to these kids they were actually really happy they said that i got to play the olympics at the age of 20 i am so thankful to my coach i am thankful to the to the academy to the institution and it sort of points to the broader perspective shift, shift in the sense that uh, yes they want to win medals you cannot play the olympics if you're not the best and, and that means you need to have that edge you need to have that you know i wouldn't say cut throat but you need to have that competitive edge if you want to make it to the olympics never mind winning a medal there and as somebody who's watched uh, uh, at least so i was also a pistol shooter myself so i have played uh, and i watched manu bakar play right in front of me so they come in with that edge they walk in with that uh, let's say that chip on the shoulder they know that they are the best but the point is you still have to do it on the day when it comes and that means you have to groom the athlete you have to sort of there's a lot of techniques that go into it if you talk to an elite level athlete they'll tell you that uh, if you read abhinav indra's uh, biography for example he talks about how every single day when he opened his eyes he would visualize himself lifting the gun and placing it at the olympics and you know aiming for the target this is what the first thought was in his mind when he woke up in the morning so that sort of visualization as a as a psychiatrist as a psychologist would tell you or a, a mental trainer a mind trainer would tell you is extremely important because the more you learn to deal with that pressure because a lot of athletes talk so talent is there in each and every one of us but the fact is you have to produce on the day it matters so at the end of the day you talk about china so if you talk about the world record score at present which is which belongs to a chinese athlete in the 10 meter rifle event which is where shri abhinav bindra won the medal which is where uh, arjun babuta finished fourth at the current or fourth at the current olympic this is where mr garan narang won his medal uh swapnil was in the 50 meter event but what they talk about is that they talk about the scores that the chinese are rating 
But the fact is, I I see the kids in front of me. I see Dhanush hitting that score here at the range in front of me. So the question is no longer about ability, Abhishek. It is about performing when it actually matters. That means you need to have that that edge. You need to have that uh, mental strength to produce when it actually matters. So I have another athlete who works. At, so I handle the Kilo India division. We have around 30 athletes uh, in our academy. Who are sponsored by the central government as a part of the Kilo India Talent Development Scheme. So, if there are any parents out there listening to this podcast, if there are any prospective athletes out there who are trying to understand what are the government initiatives, Kilo India is a great initiative by the government to identify the upper and coming talents and to give them financial support. So, we are no longer talking about the cream of the crop. You are not no longer talking about PV Sindhu or uh, Saina Nehwal or Sanjay Mirza. You are talking about the up and coming 16 year olds, 17 year olds, 18 year olds. These are the ones who are going to be. These are the ones who are going to become household names tomorrow. They are the next Manu Bhakar and the next Sarab Jodh Singh. So when you talk about these guys, when you talk about Amar Chakravat, for example, these are guys who are sponsored by the part of these schemes. And at that point of time, my role is to sort of work with the athlete to understand that they are making the best of these government schemes. OGQ being a private organization, it is a non-profit. But it is an NGO, so for that reason, they are sort of—I wouldn't say hindered, but they are sort of limited by the kind of you know schemes that they can offer. However, the government has stepped in, and over the last uh, few years, they have sort of uh, doubled and tripled the budget, the sports budget that goes into it. So, as somebody who works with state and central government bodies uh, here in Telangana, I can tell you that there is a lot of interest in uh, developing sporting infrastructure. But also in developing athletes as well. So the Kilo India initiative is one such initiative where there is a financial funding that goes into uh, sort of uh, you know supporting these athletes who are up and coming. And what it does is that that helps you make that transition from a national player to an international player, and eventually to an international medalist. So I had this athlete uh, who was world number one in 2022, Rudrangsh Patel. Uh, he was the first Indian after Shri Abhinavindra to win gold at the ISS of World Championships, which happened once in four years. It is the after the Olympics. It is the premier uh, shooting championship. So this happened in 2022 in Cairo, in Egypt, and he came back with a world record and the gold medal. And of course, at that point of time, when I spoke to him, it was all congratulations. It was all smiles. Uh, two years down the line, he competed in the Olympic selection trials, and. He did not make it through. So I asked him, Rudrangsh, uh, what went wrong? So he told me it was very enlightening what he said. If people Google it. There are a lot of controversy surrounding the selection policy, but what he said was, I had everything that was required. I was given every single support that I needed, whether it is in terms of equipment, whether it is in terms of sports science, whether it is in terms of coaching. The academy has given him what he needs. The government has given him all the support he requires. But what I did not realize is that I need to be the ultimate decision taker. I need to decide which competitions to play, which not to play. I have to understand the selection policy myself. Maybe I should not have played so many internationals because it put pressure on me. Because you travel out of the country, you go to a different country, you play in all these different weather conditions. It's called periodization. Periodization is extremely important. So here at uh, GFG at Gun for Glory, we've already started periodization for the 2028 LA Olympics, and that started before the Paris Olympics. So that is the way you mold long-term performance, the way you, you know, sort of create results. I know I went off on a bit of a side track here, but I think this speaks to the the question that you asked about what it takes for somebody to get to the highest levels and what sort of holistic environment. the federations yes. the academies the institutions that surround you can provide which we do have today so those who think that it is not there you just need to do a google search to find out for sure and what i will do arun is i will link the kelo india and the guns for glory website in the show notes so for any anyone listening that's curious about your program and your work i'd love for you to because one hour is not enough time to really understand the depth and the nuance of the of the opportunities available and i think this would be a great way for young people in india interested in a sport like shooting to understand more about the opportunities but with kelo india i'm sure there are other sports 
that young people can also be exposed to. Now, you know, for the last question, Arun, I, what I was curious about, I know you mentioned the name of Kobe Bryant. And when I was preparing for this interview, you know, I, I know that Manu Bakar won two medals this time. But in the last Olympics in Tokyo, she had like a pistol, like a gun malfunction, right? And that story was not, you know, it must have been such a hard mental toll for someone that dedicated their whole life. And she said that, you know, prayer was something that really helped her. And then even for Sri Gagan Narangji, his in the TED Talk, he mentioned that his family, his parents actually sold the land they lived on to buy a gun when they were not sure he was going to be an athlete. And they stayed on rent for 20 years, you know, till and uh, to, to get their son what he needed, you know. So this is such an inspiring story. But apart from shooting, because you're such a sports, you know, enthusiast and sports nerd, are there any athletes that you see in the world, you know, who you are inspired by? You know, for me, it's always been like Michael Jordan or Virat Kohli, just because of their drive and that X factor that they have. But maybe one or two athletes that, or maybe even one athlete who you think, you know, whose career sort of, you know, embodies this this journey of mental and physical strength that an athlete should really stand for? It's a loaded question. <laughs> but uh, I can... Like I, a gun, right? <laughs> so, you are perfect. You are 100% right. I'm very much a sports nerd. I am super into... I've been super into sports for the last couple of decades now. And uh, in spite of being in my 30s, I have always looked at what what could I have done? What, 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 would, what, would I, what would I have done differently? And at that point of time, I'm always into understanding the background of all these athletes. And of course, Kobe, Kobe is a huge inspiration with his uh, Mamba mentality. And uh, LeBron is another example. MJ, though, is MJ in terms of mind. Uh, Jordan stands head and shoulders above a lot of these athletes. Cristiano Ronaldo is another example of uh, what, what it can have, what you can have as. Uh, what mentality, what uh, champion's mentality can do for you as a person and, uh, you know, how you can inspire future generations as well. Whether it is uh, Kobe through his speech at uh, at his graduation, at his uh, alma mater, or whether it was uh, Ronaldo sort of moving the Coke bottle away from the screen and replacing it with a bottle of water, that actually has a profound impact. I cannot stress enough the impact that those kinds of gestures might have. But since you asked for one, I would say my motivation is the story of uh, Luka Modric. So Luka Modric came from war-torn Croatia. He is around 39 years old person. So you can say in his early 80s, he was born in a country ridden by civil war. And he lost his parents at an early age, was brought up by his uh, grandparents. And then he had to undergo the trauma of uh, losing his grandfather, grandfather as well. All this before the age of 10. So uh, you can imagine the sort of impact that uh, having and then losing that sort of figure in your life can have. And uh, Modric, uh, if those who those who follow football know that he is not a physically imposing person. He stands at somewhere around 5'8", five, 5'9", five, to my knowledge, which is pretty... Uh, short for a footballer, for a professional footballer, especially today. And yet, uh, he is one of the finest uh, footballers to ever walk the planet because of the mentality factor that he brings in. The never say die attitude that he brings in, whether it is playing for his club or whether it is playing for his country, Croatia, whom as captain he took to their best ever. Uh, finish at the 2018 uh, World Cup where they finished uh, in the they, they lost in the final to eventual winners France but the very fact that a country of the size of Croatia which I which I doubt is bigger than the state of Goa to take that country to the final of the football World Cup and to win the best player award while being on the losing team so he ended up so this, this World Cup was in Russia and uh, there was a very interesting stat, uh, I, I won't take long, but a very interesting stat that popped out during this, uh, during after that World Cup. So what happened is in 2020, the sort of Russian doping sc scandal, all those things came out. But along with that, a very interesting statistic popped out where 
when the world cup happened in russia when the football world cup happened in uh, russia in 2018 there was a tracking of all the top athletes the you know their uh, how many kilometers that did they run what was the top speeds that they achieved a lot of other things what was the area they covered blah 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 uh, one pointer statistic was how much distance that each athlete covered over the span of 90 minutes which is the duration of a football match so you divide it by the number of matches you played and you get the total distance covered per 90 minutes which is the duration of a match and out of the top 10 the top 9 were russians which sort of points to the fact maybe maybe it had something to do with the fact that you know with the doping scandal whatsoever because we never talked about russia as a powerhouse in football and it's not like they produced that sort of vessel maybe even at an individual level even though it's a pretty decent team but the 10th name on that list was a 33 year old luka modric so a 33 year old so that th- a 30 as uh, <laughs> i can guarantee you uh, you and i are you know almost there now so uh, 33 year olds do not cover that sort of distance of 10 kilometers 11 kilometers across a span of for 90 minutes unless you are physically and mentally driven to do that so the fact is that he actually competed with people who were on uh, doped the fact that he actually managed to crack that top 10 itself speaks volumes about him because he was not expected to play that role his role was more of controlling the game in you know his goal against argentina was everything that uh, uh, a football fan wants to see because it was a performance of the highest standards but the very fact that he managed to do it competing against a set of people who were actually enhanced who were taking performance enhancing drugs and actually to perform at that level and then to take that country to the final of the toughest competition on the planet while you know there is like 1.4 billion people watching him the very fact that he did it and then and then of course everybody when talks about football of course it's the messi ronaldo debate but modric was the old, was the only individual since 2007 when uh, sorry 2008 when kaka won the ballon d'or the best player in the world award it was all messi and ronaldo after that and yet in 2018 he is the one who broke that duopoly of messi and ronaldo by being crowned the best player in the world so that sort of speaks volumes about the mentality of someone who came through a civil war lost his family members lost crucial family members at a formative age and then came through a system which which frankly speaking india has a way better system than those kind of countries are whether it's the czech republic or uh, serbia or croatia and yet managing to come through that system and get showing the mentality that it takes to perform at the highest levels in front of god knows how many billion people are watching that sort of speak volumes about what this guy has up here and uh, a certain other place which i don't want to talk about but the very fact that he's able to do it consistently and he's still going strong at the age of 39 he still plays for one of the biggest football clubs on the planet in real madrid he still continues to represent croatia and captain them and while he may not be at his prime his career like uh, jordans speaks for itself so if you ask me he is everything that you want to see in an athlete he is he is a family man he takes care of his body because l- let's be honest at the age of 39 it is very rare to find a professional playing at the highest levels of the game and the fact that he continues to do it is an inspiration to each and every one yeah and you know i i think like listening to you today i just realized that being an athlete is not just such a physical thing it's it's both a physical and a mental journey and i think it's not something you can just do once but it's something you have to be consistent and disciplined with for a really long time and i think when once you are an athlete you are always an athlete so skills that young people learn as an athlete can be transferred on to any other area of their life and can help them in so many different ways in any pursuit that they go on to do so you know i it was really really inspiring hearing, hearing you speak arun i really hope a lot of young people listen to this uh, not just young people that are curious about sports but also your journey in terms of how you transferred from you know the uh, the meningitis to you know taking up uh, football to going to engineering to you know doing so well in sports management i think there's a lot we can learn from over there arun yeah, i appreciate you having me here abhishek and i really love what you're doing here so 
the very fact that uh, you ask these questions the very fact that you are interested and you know people are reaching out and asking the right kind of questions does point to that change in mentality that is what i want to see as somebody in uh, in this industry in this environment is people asking the right kind of questions i don't mind so it's it's like we say in teaching also there are no stupid questions yeah. the only stupid people are the ones who don't ask the questions when you ask the questions and you get the answers and then you start that you start your journey it is also spiritual it is an awakening by itself and i hope that a lot of people and anybody who listens gets i always tell people that any time you listen if you take something of value away from every conversation that you that you have with any individual it could be a 6 year old it could be a 60 year old but if you take away something of value from that conversation it means that you've done your you've done your due diligence so if uh, uh, i'm glad that uh, of course you can you will be listing the details of kilo india but if anybody out there who has any questions about how to make it uh, big my my uh, my my contacts are available on linkedin as well so uh, anybody if they have any doubts i am available for any questions that they might have whether it is to make it as an athlete or it is to make it as uh, as a you know as somebody who wants to contribute to the environment or sports For sure, and I will be linking Arun's LinkedIn profile in the show notes as well. And for the listeners tuning in, thank you again for listening to this episode of Learning Stories. Do subscribe to the channel, and uh, you can listen to this episode of Learning Stories on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Geo Savan, and YouTube. Um, I'm excited to release this episode, and uh, excited to see your response to this. Um, thank you again for listening to this episode, and this is Abhishek Shetty signing off with Arun Molot on the Learning Stories podcast.